Okay, welcome to the first arts and lecture event in the fall semester of 2017. The title of today's event is The Limits of Humanly Knowable Mathematical Truth, Goodell's Incompleteness Theorems, and Artificial Intelligence. My name is John Kwon, and I'm a faculty member in the mathematics department. Today's presentation will be approximately 15 minutes long, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers, ending at 1 p.m. The presentation is being videotaped and transmitted live to the Petaluma campus. If you need to leave the auditorium before uh, the event is over, please do not walk in front of the camera. At this time, please turn off all electronic devices that could interrupt the program. All right. <laughs> it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, a colleague and a good friend of mine, Tim Melvin, a mathematics professor here at San Rosa Junior College. Tim was born and raised in San Jose. After graduating from University of the Pacific, he worked as an auditor at a mortgage firm. Realizing he had limited time on this earth, he decided to pursue something more intellectually stimulating and enrolled at Cal State University, Sacramento. He graduated in 2009 with a master's degree in mathematics before deciding to pursue his PhD in mathematics at Washington State University in Eastern Washington. After two years at Washington State, Tim accepted a position as a full-time math instructor at Carroll College in the beautiful city of Helena, Montana, where he learned how to be a college professor, finished his uh, PhD dissertation in linear algebra, and met a philosophy professor who was and still is as excited about logic, metal logic, and Goodell's incompleteness theorems as Tim is. After many hours of discussion and debate, and most importantly, many beers, Tim and his philosopher colleague wrote a couple of papers on Goodell's incompleteness theorems as they pertain to the nature of artificial intelligence, which he will discuss in his talk. Despite Montana's magnificent beauty, Tim and his wife, Jessica, wanted to return to Northern California, so he gratefully and happily accepted a position in San Rosa Junior College's mathematics department in 2014. Now, as a lifelong Golden State Warriors fan and a true student of logic, Tim will gladly take credit that his return to Northern California directly led to the Warriors' dominance in the NBA <laughs> the past three years. And now, here is Dr. Tim Melvin. Thank you, John. <laughs> All right, can you guys hear me? Is this going? All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much for being here, giving up your lunch hour to come uh, listen about logic and girls of completeness theorem. And of course, I threw in that artificial intelligence as a nice hook. Um, before we jump in, my original title for this, and I wasn't courageous enough to keep it, was uh, an argument against an argument against artificial intelligence using girdles and completeness theorems, using girdles and completeness theorems. <laughs> I love this title, but I was like, oh, that's just going to throw people off. Why are you just circling back on itself? And it, I think it flows nicely with what girdle eventually did, which we'll get to towards the end of the talk. Um, before we get to that, though, uh, did everyone bring their scantrons? There will be a 20-page multiple-choice quiz after. No, no, no. Um, Though, if there are any actual practicing logicians in the crowd, sorry, this talk is not for you. We're going to get into the uh, kind of big picture, uh, the big themes of what Girdle did, and kind of the historical context that led to that. We're not going to get into the details of Girdle's proof as much as I want to. I'd probably be kicked out of the school if I did that. So um, we're going to go back, and I'll start with history. I'm going to talk about the formalization, or oh, I hate saying this word, axiomatization of mathematics. So mathematics, uh, mathematicians, philosophers, intellectuals wondered, could all the results of mathematics in a certain branch be kind of condensed or derived from a fixed set of axioms, rules of inferences, and so on? And I would say this goes back at least as far back as the ancient Greeks. Those of you heard of uh, Euclid's elements, uh, the uh, ancient Greek tried to kind of formalize geometry with undefined terms such as points and axioms. I believe one of them is uh, a single line goes through two points, or a unique line. Um, but I'm going to kind of jump ahead in a, a couple hundred or thousand years and kind of focus on the last couple hundred years 
and looking at mathematicians, philosophers, really starting in the 18th century. Um, and some of the questions that were going on 18th, 19th, and then currently, from a certain fixed set of axioms, could we make sure that there's no contradictions or paradoxes? Right, mathematicians want to make sure everything's clear, we don't get any uh, crazy stuff. Um, so I want to talk about a couple paradoxes to start, because I think they're fun. So I want to start with uh, Guido Grandi, who was an uh, Italian monk, mathematician, philosopher, etc. He thought he had a proof that God exists. So let's go through his proof. He took this sum, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, and so on. And he thought, and he saw that arithmetic is associative. So what I mean by that is take 2 plus 3 plus 4. Well, that's 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 4 is 9. Or you could take 3 plus 4, 7 plus 2. It doesn't matter the order of which you add stuff together. You're going to get the same thing. And I always like to tell my students, mathematicians are inherently lazy. It looks like we're subtracting and adding. No, 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 mathematicians say we're just adding. We're just adding negative numbers. So we only have to do one thing at a time. One plus minus one plus one. So uh, Grandy said, well, what if we group this, uh, this sum as such? So the first two terms add together, then the second two terms, and the third two terms, and so on. So what does this equal? One minus one or one plus minus one? We got zero, all right? Plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. So Grandy said, well, this sum gets to zero. But what if we group it a slightly different way? Ignore this first number, this first one, and then group in pairs like this. And we end up with one plus zero, plus zero, plus zero, plus zero, plus zero, which of course adds up to one. So voila, Grandy publishes. From something, we get nothing. Thus, <laughs> I'll let you fill in the blanks. <laughs> uh, mathematicians, you know, soon after this, probably uh, at least by the 19th century, kind of took care of this with a strict rule of definitions. How do we, when we add infinite terms, those dot, dot, dots, we have to be a little more careful. I uh, won't get into those rules right now. Take calculus 1B here and you'll learn some of those. Um, and maybe you think, well, that's, that's just 1 plus, minus 1. This isn't very interesting. That's just some trickery. Let's look at one more. Let's take a sum, 1 minus 1 plus a third, or sorry, 1 minus a half plus a third minus a quarter plus a fifth, and so on and so on. And I used to joke, oh, if you had a cocktail party, of course, all your friends have a calculator, so you tell them to plot a calculator and add these up. But now we all have these smartphones, so yeah, just tell your friends, okay, start adding these numbers in your calculator. And you'll soon see that they seem to be getting somewhere. You now, this number keeps going on forever and ever, but we'd say the sequence of numbers, the sum, converges. So it's not like the last one, the one minus one, might not make any sense. We actually do get something. All right, well, let's take half of the sum, half of 0.693, or we could take half of each of these terms in here and make sure I did my arithmetic correctly. So we get half of one minus half of two to get a quarter, half of a third, half of a fourth, half of a fifth, and so on. All right, and that'll be you know, half of 0.693 and so on. Well, what if we add the top sum with the second sum? Take this alpha character, this alpha number, add it to half of itself, and I get a one, just one, and what happens to those halves? Cancel. They go away. So what's next in line? I get a third right here. There'll never be a third in this list, so we get a third. All right, and then I get a minus a quarter and minus a quarter, both negative. So that gives me minus two quarters, which is a half. And then, uh, let's see, we'll get the fifth. Again, all the odd number denominators aren't going to reappear on the, the, the second sum. And let's see, what's next? We got a minus an eighth and minus an eighth and then a seventh, and then we would get minus a six, and so on. If you want to, you know, at home just for funsies, list out some more numbers, you keep getting all these numbers. But what do you notice about that bottom sum? Let's see if I point out, I got one, I got minus a half, that's right here. I get positive one third. I get minus a quarter, minus two eighths. 
you could show, and if we had more time and more terms, we get everything back in this alpha sum exactly once. So we get alpha back again. So then take this equation, alpha plus half alpha, subtract alpha, I get one half alpha equals zero, doing a little bit of algebra, but alpha is not zero. So we could divide by it, divide by one half alpha to get one equals zero. All right, proof number two. So what is wrong with this one? I'm gonna leave that as a homework exercise. <laughs> If you are curious to read more about this, this is called the Alternating Harmonic Series. I'm sure if you just Google that, you could find some information. Um, one issue is we're rearranging these terms, which is fine if you have a finite sum, but infinite sum, weird stuff happens. All right, so again, this was taken care of kind of similar time period. All right, took care of this paradox. All right, axiomatization or this way of formalizing mathematics, calculus. A lot of you guys have to take calculus, or at least know of calculus, pinnacle of our high school system, going to college, engineers. Well, it was kind of pioneered, discovered, invented by two people. We think of Newton, because we come from the English side of education. But uh, my personal hero in this story is Leibniz, Gottfried Leibniz. For one, look at that hair. That's just amazing. To grow that amazing hair. Um, and he was more focused kind of on computers. He was ahead of his time thinking about comp mechanical computation devices. But in this calculus, which is just really a mathematical way to measure immediate change, very quick immediate change, he defined these infinitesimals. He called them dx, that's his notation. And he said this is a fixed positive number, but that is smaller than any other positive real number. That should bother you a little bit, because if you take a fixed positive number, can you make it smaller? You could just half it or divide it by 10. You could always get it smaller. So this bothered mathematicians, philosophers at the time. They said, well, wait a minute. How could you have a fixed positive number? That doesn't really make any sense. The engineer said, who cares? This calculus is great. It's solving problems. Engineers and scientists, economists are saying, this is great. It's, it's working. You, you weird mathematicians, philosophers could deal with the, uh, the foundation of this system. All right, one more, probably the most important reason why we need to make sure we're in a secure, axiomatic, logical system, computers. Everybody's favorite. Again, going back to really the mid-18th century, people were starting to think about automated mechanical devices. Now, they weren't electrical computers at the time. Um, we have electrical computers now. But we want to make sure that we build these up with a finite set of instructions and they make sense. We don't want to have the computer trundle along forever and not give us the output. If anyone's coded, you might have seen that before, get an endless loop. All right, okay. All right, so I wanna kinda, kinda keep that in the back of your mind. This, this formalism, this axiomatization of mathematics. And I'm gonna give a kinda sorta history of, of numbers. And I say kinda sorta because this is not 100% accurate, but the story is more important than the truth. Wait, no, no. Maybe that's not a good thing to say. Okay, uh, but generally, I like to think of uh, my nephews when I go through this. I got a three and an eight-year-old nephew. I kind of think about, well, the history of humans kind of follows how they learn math and numbers. And of course, I'm the weird uncle that's always asking about what they're learning in their math classes and how they're learning it. Uh, but my three-year-old nephew, he counts one, two, four, five, six. I don't know why he hates the three so much, but he's starting to get those, those whole numbers, or we're gonna call them natural numbers. Evidence of those far back is 50, 60,000 years, we think, of, of natural numbers. And then we move to uh, Z's called the integers. So that throws in all of the negative numbers and zero. And a couple years ago, my older nephew asked him, oh, well, if you have three, what happens if you add six? And he gets out his fingers and he counts to nine. He's very happy, excellent. And then I say, okay, if you have three things, three pieces of candy, what happens if you take, take away six, subtract six? And he starts counting, and his eyebrow gets really furled, and he's like, that's not a number. <laughs> he's like, oh, you'll get there in a year or two. Uh, so throw in those negative numbers, and then some people put zero in the natural number, some people don't. We'll, we'll probably throw it in later. I like to not put it in, because generally it takes longer for little kids and humanity to get to that zero symbol. 
All right, and then uh, we took these whole numbers, the negative numbers, and then Q are the rational numbers. What if we need to start dividing stuff up? So ratios of whole numbers, assuming you know, no zero on the denominator. That's, that's not allowed. Um, so many, many different rational numbers, any ratio of integers. And then we led to, eventually, we got to the set of real numbers. So real numbers are uh, square root of 2 pi. Everything in here, these sets are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, the ancient Greeks, or at least a couple schools of thought in ancient Greece, they thought that every single number was rational. And then some person came about and said, no, 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 the square root of 2, which, which they got with uh, looking at triangles, is not rational. And they were not very happy about that. There might have been some murder, maybe not. Uh, but in a standard high school education, we think of these as decimals. You get all the decimals you want. All right, and I won't spend much time today, but then we get the uh, latest set would be the complex numbers, the imaginary numbers, and allows for such ridiculous uh, numbers that solve x squared plus 1 equals 0. Because if you think about a number squared, it's always going to be positive or 0. So how could you add a positive number and a positive number to get 0? Well, you can't. And some, a lot of cool applications came from that. Okay, but I, I want to focus on, on the minutiae of these sets. This is kind of the invention, discovery, manipulation, algebra, then calculus kind of built on top of these number systems. And as I said, in the last couple hundred years, mathematicians say, are we sure everything is concrete and good? We don't have any weird paradoxes or contradictions in these both number systems and how we think about them. So the, again, kind of sort of history of the uh, formalism or axiomatization of these number systems kind of went in reverse. Not completely, but it's just easier for just going reverse. So it was proved that these complex numbers were on a solid mathematical foundation, no contradictions, paradoxes, if the real numbers are. So if we could show the real numbers are, then the complex numbers are. All right, well then the real numbers were shown to be on a solid mathematical foundation, the set of axioms and rules of inference, if the rational numbers are as well. And you could figure out what's going to happen next, at least on my slides. <laughs> okay, the rational numbers are shown to be on a good foundation, if the integers are, those positive and negative numbers. And then lastly, the integers are shown to be on a solid foundation, but only if those whole numbers, the natural numbers, are. And I ran, ran out of space on here, so the natural numbers did not get shown. No, no. <laughs> so it kind of led up to this set of natural numbers. Okay, that's the foundation. All these numbers are built on these whole numbers. If we could show that we could create a finite list of axioms, statements we take for truth, rules of inference, then we could build up the rest of this system, at least these number systems. All right, so that's kind of where we're at the story right now. And uh, there are a number of different ways to kind of get at, well, how do we think of these natural numbers? One way that gained a lot of steam was uh, uh, kind of set up by uh, Georg Cantor, German mathematician. He introduced the notion of sets. Uh, now, he specifically wasn't trying to build an axiomatic system for the natural numbers. He had other questions that he was interested in. But later, mathematicians thought, could we use this foundational notion of a set to build up these whole numbers and talk about them? in a clear, concise way. Um, but there's one issue. His set theory was called naive because some logical inconsistencies were later discovered. And I love, I think that there's a nice trend the last couple years in, in Hollywood to make movies of scientists, mathematician, you know, Hidden Figures, the Stephen Hawking movie, the Ramachandran movie. I think there's a, a, good, a good case to be made that we should make a movie of Cantor. And I'm wondering, is Sean Connery still making movies? I feel like he could be a good, I don't know. If you think of someone else who looks like, we need a George, your Cantor movie. But, okay, so what was wrong with his set theory? Well, Cantor said you, a set exists if you could describe it, if there's some rule or explanation for it. So I can make a set that says the set of all people in this audience right now. And that would be a set of you know, 30, 40 or something like that. So we have a set of people because I could describe it. 
And that, that worked really well until um, Bertrand Russell and a couple other philosophers started picking at this idea of, well, if you could describe it, we could describe sets in a strange way. And we'll talk about Bertrand Russell some more in a second, but he said, let's define a set. We describe it to be the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. Well, how could a set be a member of itself? Don't ask that question. It doesn't matter. <laughs> So he posed this set, and that's just the notation for the set. You don't have to worry about that. Just this, the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. Well, does R contain itself? Well, what if it does? If it contains itself, then by definition, it's a not a member of itself. So if it contains itself, by definition of itself, it does not contain itself. Did I say that right? <laughs> so then obviously must not contain itself, but then by the definition of R, if it doesn't contain itself, then it contains itself. So uh, some, some you know, philosophers whatnot will call this a, a loop or a strange loop. It just keeps going, well, it doesn't contain itself, so it does. If it doesn't, it does, and it keeps going back and forth. Paradox. Not good. Mathematicians don't like this. It's a clear statement about mathematics, so we think we should be able to say if it's true or false, but we just get this weird kind of loopy paradox. And another way you might have seen this uh, paradox is called the, uh, oh yeah, my head hurts, <laughs> the Barber of Seville. Possibly. The Barber of Seville paradox says uh, the town of Seville has just one barber. The barber is a man who shaves all those and only those men in town who do not shave themselves. So does the barber shave himself? Suppose he does. What happens if he shaves himself? The, he does not shave himself according to his own rule. They think, well, this barber's stupid. What's wrong with him? <laughs> I'll give this into my, my discrete math class, and they become lawyers. Well, wait a minute. What if the barber, and I try to find all the issues with this. I'm like, well, it's a nice little word puzzle. Um, all right, so Cantor kind of had this issue. You can't just describe sets on their own. But later, mathematicians kind of took care of that. They built a lot more structure around these sets, a lot more axioms, rules of inferences, so that this can't happen. So we still kind of take Cantor's set theory idea. We still uh, research it, teach it, learn it as mathematicians, but we put a little more structure on it. All right, so using some of the ideas from Cantor's set theory, I'm going to go back to, uh, to Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell, mathematician, philosopher, and then Alfred North Whitehead. They published uh, the Principia Mathematica. I'm going to call that PM from now on, the Principia. It's this giant tome. I'll show you a little snippet of it in a second. This giant book or series of books that gives this finite set of axioms, symbols, rules of inferences from which all arithmetic truths, just about whole numbers, so we're not talking about you know, calculus students, none of the calculus or anything, just whole numbers. And that was their intent. That was their hope. Could we build a mechanical way, a finite system that will prove everything and will be free of all those weird paradoxes and consistencies? If they could do that, think of all the number systems, the whole cascade works. We get the negative numbers, rationals, reals, and so on. And I just love this picture of Russell. Like, was, was this his uh, philosopher pose right there? Such a good picture. Okay, so I want to talk about this for a little bit. Not, not too long. I don't want to get into too many of the details of the Principia. The kind of joke is it takes 200 pages to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. So they build everything foundational and everything precisely. It's not entirely true. We'll get there in a second. So I'm going to throw just some symbols. And actually, these aren't all the symbols they used at the time, but they're symbols what a lot of modern logic textbooks use. So I'm going to use these symbols. Uh, we have existential quantifier, this little backwards E. There exists a number. There is something. This upside down A is the for all. Again, another thing in the system, you know, if we think about a computer doing this or, or making this mechanical, these symbols have no meaning. But to us, they do. We th want them to follow the rules of how we think. Upside down V would be an and. A dot is sometimes used for statements P and Q. Uh, 
a little tilde for not or the negation of a statement. Uh, P implies Q is uh, the conditional statement, if P then Q. And then we had um, different kind of variable types for numbers. And then we had uh, variables for entire statements. And there's punctuation, parentheses, commas, periods, and so on. And uh, just a couple of axioms. There's a whole bunch of axioms to the Principia. But as an example, these are statements that we're not going to prove. We're just going to state them to be true. Finite set of statements that we could build everything else on mathematics. So there's immediate successor to the number one, or number zero, which is one successor. For all natural numbers, uh, if x equals y, then y equals x. So we're not going to prove that equality is commutative. Just assume it's true. And there's a lot more axioms. I just want to put, give a couple snippets. Uh, rules of inferences. How do you build new statements? Again, there's a whole bunch of these, but I'm just going to put up two. Modus ponens. If P implies Q is a true statement. And if P is a Q statement, then Q is a true statement. And probably the most standard, most basic way of uh, at least human logic. And modus tollens, kind of the opposite uh, idea of P, and P implies Q is a true statement, and Q is false, then P has to be false. Sometimes it's called the contrapositive of the modus ponens. And there's a whole bunch of these. Lastly, uh, a theorem is some statement. Again, it's going to be a statement about whole numbers in this principia, this giant tome that has been proven using the axioms, other proven theorems, and rules of inferences. And honestly, this is what kind of originally drew me to math, more so in graduate school. I was like, oh, that's really cool. I could take this small set, and all of mathematics, in some ways, is built from this, which is also, I think, a reason why people hate mathematics, because you've missed that one day of class. It's like a <laughs> cascading effect. <laughs> so double-edged sword there. And a proof in terms of this uh, Principia Mathematica is a finite string of statements that use these rules of inferences, axioms, and theorems. So the idea is, okay, we've got a bunch of axioms, rules of inferences. Could we just crank out theorems? And really without meaning. We don't really even know what exactly we're proving. And computers have been built as far back as the 60s that have gone through the Principia or something similar and proven you know, statements about whole numbers uh, completely mechanically, completely automa automatically. Okay, here's an example. And I said that uh, 1 plus 1 equals 2. It actually took 362 pages. And actually, I lied, because it's not quite there. One arithmetic addition has been defined that 1 plus 1 equals 2. So giant tome. Again, they use slightly different notation I showed, but this is kind of mechanical. You read through the proofs. It is not made for humans to read. It's very precise. They're referencing previous uh, results and using all the notation, but that was kind of the point. This is not necessarily for human thought. It's supposed to be mechanized. And uh, actually, I found up a much bigger proof of the same exact result, but it showed some of these results here, and it was like four or five pages. So I just put a little snippet on here. So those of you in a math class, at least you don't have to do this. <laughs> Okay, so I want to look at two statements, a little bit easier to digest in the Principia Mathematica. All right, statement one. This says that's a for all or for every. For every whole number y, there is a whole number x, where x is greater than y. Is that true or false? That's question number two on your Scantron. You guys are keeping track. <laughs> for any whole number, can we find a bigger whole number? Yes. All right, so this would be a statement you'd want to be able to prove that is true, again, using the rules of inferences, axioms, and so on. All right, what about two? Again, that's that for all or for every, for every whole number y, there's a whole number x, where y is x squared. A little bit more going on with this one. Yeah, this is, this is a false, because we're only dealing with whole numbers. This is saying every whole number is a perfect square. And I threw three. There's many examples. Three is not a perfect square. Basically, this is the way that the Principia tried to get at square roots. They didn't define a square root, but same idea. Solve for this, solve for x, you get a square root. 
Square root of three is a real number, but it's not a whole number. So this would be a false statement. So you'd be able to want to prove in Principia that it's false, you know, with this counterexample would work just fine. All right, so as I said in the beginning, kind of two big questions about this system, or really any system in mathematics. Is it consistent? So what I mean by that, is there some statement, I'll call it T in the Principia, where T and not T, that tilde is the negation, not T, can be proven? If there does exist such a sentence, we would say that PM is inconsistent. This is the zero equals one, dogs and cats living together, world end scenario. Not good. Mathematicians want to make sure we don't get any contradictions. Not exactly the same thing as a paradox. Paradoxes could be solved different ways. This is a contradiction because you're dealing with that fixed uh, mechanical system that is the Principia. So this was, I would argue, this is the most important question in terms of, and the two I want to go to, is, is the Principia Mathematica consistent? And the other question I mentioned at the beginning, is it complete? Basically, could we prove or say anything we want uh, about a statement that involves whole numbers? So we say the Principia is complete if we could prove either S or the negation of S within the Principia. I'm going to talk about that in a second. For any statement that asserts some property about whole numbers. So there are rules set up by Gödel and then um, Russell and Whitehead about what constitutes a valid statement. They're sentences that are just gibberish, and then these need to be statements that actually say something about a whole number. So anything about a whole number, we should be able to say it's true or false. Two is greater than 10, false. We should be able to prove that within the system, and so on. So kind of two big questions. So I want to get back, let me go back a second, to that within. So the proof needs to stay within the system. So I want to talk just for, just briefly about Fermat's last theorem. Some of you might have seen this. I'm assuming you haven't. All right, there's a lot of quantifiers going on. There's a negation for all n greater than 3. There exists x, y, and z that x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. Right, if, you don't want to, if you don't want to dig through that uh, notation, T basically states there are no whole number solutions, x, y, and z, that solve the equation x to the n plus y then equals z to the n, if that power is 3 or greater. So if we make the power 2, there are actually infinitely many sets of whole numbers that make that work. Can you think of any? Just squares. <laughs> 3, 4, 5, I think, is the first one. If I, or is there two, seven? Oh, I'm, now I'm on the spot. I should have looked them up. So three, four, five works. We just need one example. Three squared plus four squared, nine plus 16 is five squared, 25. And there are infinitely many. These are called Pythagorean triples, the Pythagorean formula. So a question came about, well, what if we make the power bigger than two? Three, four, five, six. So in 19, or excuse me, 1637, <laughs> amateur mathematician. I say amateur because he, he was technically a lawyer, but he's one of the, pillars of mathematicians that we have, uh, claim to have, have a proof of this statement. And the story goes, he was kind of, for fun, reading through a math book, came across this, this question, this open question was known for a long time. He didn't come up with the question. And he wrote in, his, uh, in the book, uh, I'm paraphrasing by a lot, I've uh, discovered an amazing proof of this statement, but the margin is too small to fit the proof of this statement. So people found that and said, oh, that's great. We've got a proof of this. Because if you want to prove a not, you, you can't check every number. There's infinitely many numbers. You'd have to have some type of argument. Well, mathematicians looked and looked and tried to figure out what was his proof. And finally, just a couple years later, 357 years later, the statement was proven by uh, an English uh, mathematician when he was at Princeton, Andrew Wiles. But the reason why I brought this up is Wiles' proof it's about a 200 plus page proof of this small statement, involve modern mathematics that was not even known at the time. So his proof did not stay within the Principia. He used results, different axioms, different results. Now you could say, well, we could add those into the list of axioms, that's fine. But if we're gonna take that fixed Principia Mathematica, this is still technically an open question. We know it's true, because it's been proven, mathematicians have vetted his proof uh, many times. 
but he, he used results that were not around at the time. They're not in that system. So this would still be open. So that's kind of key. We need to stay in the system. All right, and that leads us to, uh, to, I would say, the hero of the story, or one of my intellectual heroes. And I have this uh, outside my office door, and I, I used to have it in the background of my screen. And what do you think students would ask me whenever they see that? What's that? <laughs> no, I don't, well, I don't think so. <laughs> no, because they work together at Princeton. <laughs> Uh, that or who's the guy hanging out with Einstein? <laughs> right, one of those, who's, you know, is that Einstein or who's that dude, that weird looking dude hanging out with Einstein? So I'm hoping one of these days I'll get a, a brilliant but maybe strange student that looks at this and says, who's that guy hanging out with Kurt Girdle? <laughs> I have a feeling I have to wait a, a long time in my career to get there. But yeah, they were together at, at Princeton at the same time, so I don't think this is doctored. And they did, they did collaborate together on some, some, some work. Uh, Girdle helped Einstein with his mathematics because Einstein wasn't good at mathematics. <laughs> but anyway, we're not going to talk about his uh, contribution to physics. We're going to talk about what did he do with all this Principia Mathematica. Before that, we're going to come back to Girdle. I want to talk about, it's a French uh, philosopher, he's an amateur mathematician, Jules, I believe you'd pronounce that Richard. I'll say Richard. I don't, never took French. But he came up with this uh, paradox. So, Richard said, consider some language, I'm sure he said French, let's say English, because we speak English, that can express arithmetic properties of whole numbers. So, in English, you know, this number is divisible by 10, is greater than 4, is a perfect square, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, then he said, well, these properties then can be placed in serial order. So, property A goes before property B if it's written in fewer letters, or if it's the same number of letters, you can go to like a, a dictionary type of uh, lexicon uh, or alphabetical. So imagine we got this list of statements that all say something about whole numbers. So imagine this list, maybe the shortest list has five letters. That would be question number one. And then you could go down the line. So each statement about whole numbers corresponds to some property about whole numbers. All right, this is, uh, he came up with this, you know, probably a couple decades before uh, Girdle came up with his results, which we'll talk about. Um, so imagine you got a list of statements and then a list of numbers. So let's say a whole number on that list is Richardian if n does not have the property of the property that it's designated to. So imagine we got a list of these properties of whole numbers written in English, and then right next to that list is a whole bunch of numbers. So we say number n is not, um, is Richardian if it does not have the property. So let's look at an example. Suppose the number 100 on the list is not divisible by any other whole number other than one or itself. Well, does 100 satisfy its statement? No, because it not divisible, it's divisible by 10, divisible by two, divisible by five. So it does not go along with its description. So we would say 100 is Richardian. I'm sorry? Yes, yeah, so that's good. He asked, is this not divisible by one or itself? Yeah, that, and we could say that in a more condensed way is prime. And that's actually one of the flaws in this paradox is, well, how do you write? There's more than one way to write is prime, as I've shown right here. And 100 is not prime, so the definition of Richardian is not, there's, they're both not true, so it is Richardian. And then Jules Richard said, we have this list. The property of whether a number is Richardian is a property about whole numbers. So if it's a property about whole numbers, it belongs on the list somewhere. So there's some place on the list, number is Richardian, it's gonna belong to some number R. So the question I'm gonna pose is, is R the number that belongs to the statement is Richardian, is that Richardian? 
So let's follow. Well, what if it is? If it is Richardian, then it corresponds with the property that does not have the property designated. So if it is Richardian, it is not Richardian. <laughs> we're, we're back to the Barber of Seville. This is just a more complicated way to get to the Barber of Seville or Russell's paradox. Okay, so R is not Richardian. So if it does not have the property that it's designated by, then it's Richardian. So we get that strange loop again. It is, if it isn't, it isn't, if it is. Which, I mean, to be honest, mathematicians weren't really worried about this because there's, there's too many issues. As mentioned by an audience member, well, do we say is prime or is not divisible? You know, you'd want, you don't want the same property going on the list more than once. There's ambiguities in any uh, human language that we don't have in mathematics. So this wasn't a huge deal, just more of like a kind of interesting, you know, really more language paradox. But Gödel, the guy standing next to Einstein, he took that a little bit more seriously. So this is, he published his paper in 1931. Um, so he knew about the Principia Mathematica, as he states in this title. He knew about Richard's paradox. And basically, he was able to use that paradox and get rid of some of the ambiguities. So here's where this, this sentence down here could be a whole uh, semester's worth of lectures, which we're not going to get into. But how did he do this? He basically s listed a number. All those symbols I showed you earlier, uh, and, or, not, P implies Q, all the sentences, he gave them a number and then in, in a very clever way. And then he was able to use uh, powers of primes to be able to write any statement in the Principia and map it to a unique number. So that's kind of the Richard right there, kind of Richard ideas like, oh, he could take any statement about whole numbers and then map it to a whole number, a unique whole number. So he got rid of the ambiguities, but then he was able to get, in a very clever way, I kind of read through this every year or so and it still blows my mind, like how did he think of this? He got the number to talk about itself, basically like that Richardian, the number does not satisfy itself, you know, in a, in a a technical way, not too bad, but I don't want to go into the details, but he got the number, the statements in PM to talk about themselves, and he constructed a formula, I'm going to call it capital G in the Principia, with all the statements, that represents the metamathematical statement, the formula G is not provable within the Principia Mathematica. So using this kind of, you know, Barber of Seville, Richard paradox, the idea of a, a number talking about itself. And G is called the Gödel formula. Then he was able to show that this statement is provable in the Principia if and only if the negation is provable. Which again, that consistency part's starting to pop up. So if Principia is consistent, this can't happen. So then the Principia cannot be complete. And he used kind of metamathematical argument to, to, to show why this is true. And then he's able to argue, basically he's able to argue that the formula G is not provable. He was able to argue it's not provable outside the system. So G in fact is a true mathematical statement or formula. But he did not stay within the system, but he was able to prove that this is true. So the Principia contains a statement about whole numbers that is true, but not provable. Not demonstrable within the system. Okay, so And remember at the beginning I talked about there needs to be a finite list of axioms. Maybe a clever way is say, well, let's just make G an axiom. Then we don't have to worry about this. You know, if there's, if there's 15 axioms, well, let's just make a new Principia system with 16 axioms, and we'll just say G is true, so we don't have to worry about this proof stuff. There, ha, huh, Girdle. Got around your little argument. Uh, but he also showed in his, his uh, paper that, no, that doesn't work. Even if you take G to be a new axiom, he showed there's a process to construct a new Gödel formula, I'm calling it G prime on here, that is true but not demonstrable. You cannot prove it within the system. And his construction is recursive. All that means is if you keep adding finitely many axioms to the list, you can always find a new statement that is true but not provable within the system. So I like to think about the little Dutch boy on the dam. You plug up one hole, another one pops out, plug up another one. You could never plug all the holes in the system. 
And arguably, uh, he did this all with this Principia, Russell and Whitehead's Principia, but he also showed at the very end that this construction could be done in any finite axiomatic system that is powerful enough to prove statements involving arithmetic. You need multiplication and addition. There are systems that just deal with addition that are consistent and complete. If you have both and all the quantifiers, it doesn't work. You get essentially incomplete system. So, uh, maybe about 40 years later, uh, J.R. Lucas, philosopher, and Roger Penrose was uh, maybe most famous for working with Stephen Hawking in physics, but then he kind of transitioned to some foundations of math and philosophy. They came up with an argument against artificial intelligence. And now, not artificial intelligence as your computer kind of running your schedule for you, but Artificial intelligence in terms of a computer could do the same things we can. A mechanical brain, a computer, if it were powerful enough, had enough processing speed or whatnot, could do the same thing as us. So they argued against that. They said humans are different, and they use Girdle. So any computer Turing machine, this thing, computer is built on a finite set of instructions. Now, you can update, of course, but you know, your computer's got a finite set of circuits, rules of inferences, and so on. And if such a machine were programmable to perform operations in Principia, which they are, you, you could, there are systems and computers that will prove statements about whole numbers, Girdle showed that the machine will have limitations. It will always have some formula, some true statement of numbers that it can't prove using its processors and rules of inferences and whatnot. So they argued that there's a statement that is true, but it cannot see to be true. There's a limitation in mechanical intelligence that does not work for us, because we could see the truth in this girdle statement. Now, me and my, my uh, philosopher colleague kind of looked at this, and we're not the only ones to, to kind of say this doesn't seem quite right. As far as we know, we kind of said, well, can't we argue that we do have the same limitation? So I, I'm going to take, um, I'm going to argue against that argument. I'm going to take Einstein, because everyone's familiar with him, and we all know he's a pretty smart guy, or was a pretty smart guy. And sadly, he's dead. I need that. <laughs> so a single person, I Einstein, will have a finite number of symbolic thoughts. So symbolic means you have to speak, write them down. Symbolic thoughts in their let's lifetime. Let's draw ourselves a triangle. Let's say let's, this side has length 6. Let's say this side right over here has length 10. Uh, is that me? <laughs> and let's say that this side right over here has length x. And what I'm going to think about is how large or how small that, so that value x can be. How large or small can this side be? So the first question is... It's not my computer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just glad it's not my computer. That was it. <laughs> Much more soothing voice than mine, too, I think. <laughs> uh, well, I'm almost out of time. Okay, so... So let's say we have a very smart person, or really average, we'll have a finite set of symbolic thoughts, stuff they can write down, speak in their lifetime. Um, and these, so then the set's going to be finite. So we kind of need that assumption. If you disagree with that, then you disagree with the rest of the argument, which is fine. I, don't, I would say this is an argument, not a proof. But as long as this set's finite, it's technically axiomatizable. We could write it down as a finite list of statements about whole numbers. And we'll assume that Einstein was definitely intelligent enough to prove basic statements about whole numbers. He had enough wherewithal to, to do stuff, to prove stuff about whole numbers. So then Gödel says, the system that is Einstein has a Gödel number. If it's a finite system, it's axiomatic, basically the same approach that Gödel used, except using different symbols and whatnot for Einstein's uh, system, there will be a statement that Einstein cannot know, cannot prove, essentially, about just whole numbers. So the argument is, well, basically the same argument as Lucas and Penrose gave, but why can't it be for humans? I think it kind of follows the same limitations. And then this was my uh, philosopher friend said, well, okay, we can take one person, but why can't we throw, do the same argument for everybody on the entire planet, whoever lived? Now, the numbers are getting much bigger. Think of all the finite data, books, stuff we're writing, but it's still finite. So at any moment in history, the total number of symbolic thoughts 
as written down, spoken, whatnot, uh, is finite and thus technically axiomatizable. You could write down the list as a finite set of instructions. So humanity at any one point will have this girl number about whole numbers that, while true, we could never prove. Which makes me feel good about my profession. We'll always have something to do <laughs> in the mathematical world. So there's always going to be at least one true statement about whole numbers that humanity cannot prove. So I'd love to say, I'll argue that artificial intelligence and the human mind are the same. I, I can't say that. I'd probably be getting paid a lot more money at Google or something if I could show that. But I'm arguing that the same limitations that Girdle found as the completeness theorems that do exist in computers also exist in us. And thus we could somehow live forever. So that's the one way we can get around this. And uh, a Girdle would probably not have liked this because uh, he, he thought that the human mind is different because we could kind of think outside the realm of mathematics. So the mathematics is too big for the human mind. The human mind is more than a machine. And I can't believe I'm going to go against Girdle, but or the human mind is a machine, just a much more powerful, interesting machine. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Eight, eight minutes. If you have any questions for Dr. Melvin now, uh, please come to the mic at either aisle. Uh, do we have a microphone set up here, actually? Um, well, uh, I guess uh, we can just... Uh, oh, I can say it out. Yeah. yeah, anybody have any questions? Yes. What about statements that you can't transfer into mathematics? And what so what, what about statements you can't transfer to mathematics? Well, and that's, so, so think about consciousness or maybe, you know, artistic uh, symbolism. Um, as of now, we don't have an argument that, that, there is an argument that, well, human, the human mind is different than mechanical mind because of that idea, which in terms of girdle is kind of independent. That's what I mean. There's a lot more, of course, thank you, thought to go into this, but... Uh, the way the girdle is set up in the um, these systems, it has to be as con concrete to talk about mathematics. Now, there is some talk about making physics mechanical, and most argue you can't, but well, that. Chaos. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Chaos yes. And Roger Penrose has written a couple books about how he thinks there's connections between the quantum states, chaos, and consciousness. Uh, they're okay. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't completely agree with him, but he's smarter than me, so maybe I should agree with him. <laughs> One more. Um, I mean, basically, as, as far as I understand, your statement depends on whether or not the human mind is actually axiomatized. Um, so how do you know that we are, like, the human mind is a system and not something else? So, uh, that's good because that my, my colleague was like, well, we have finite number of thoughts, so done. If we have fine, as long as it's finite, you could shorten the list, or even if you don't, it doesn't matter whether it's 10 axioms or 10,000, as long as it's finite. But I thought the same thing. Well, do we think, uh, do we think a finite number of thoughts? And actually, it was, it was my colleague who came up with the uh, symbolic. If you have to write them down or speak them, you know, come from your brain outside somehow, that seemed a little more reasonable to me. The number, the output, the output of a human is definitely axiomatizable. Now, what's happening inside the brain, it might not be. That's where I, we can't get into that. So I only want to say the symbolic statements that we make. So essentially, the output of our artificial intelligence and the output of humanity could be the same. Correct. Yes, yes. That's the argument, not the proof, but the argument. Yes. And do we have time for one more or... I think, 
I don't disagree with that because I think you can do that similar mapping. I guess the issue is his specific proof, which I didn't go over, use the fact that the Principia, the system, talks about proving statements. So that's where it's, well, how do you prove what is beauty or an artistic statement? There's, there's concrete, you know, two is greater than three is definitely false. So I think the mapping could definitely happen, but I guess I'd have to think about the, uh, could, you, could you get the statement to talk about itself, about art? That's where I'm, I would, I'm not sure about that. But definitely. Yes. So for, for this argument with the Einstein stuff, I'm thinking just the thoughts uh, about numbers to go with the girl number. But yeah, technically going into the art, anything else we think or write down, we scratch on a notepad or type or say, it could be about anything. Yes. Now the girdle and completeness stuff only applies to statements of whole numbers. But yes. Go to... So is the, the, the issues of Girdle, which is kind of a, his statements come from this self, uh, self-reference, talking about itself. Uh, there are other statements found later by other logicians that were true but unprovable, that weren't quite so self-referential. But I don't, I don't know. So is there, is there a way to figure out how many statements that humans would not know versus an artificial intelligence? That's a good question that I have no idea. <laughs> Three hands, so. <laughs> if, if you generate the, the Girdell formula, mm-hmm. then it can be interpreted as a statement about, about numbers. So there are two sides to it, right? There's going into it. You have uh, a statement about the system, a logical statement, and coming out of it, there's a statement about the relationship between numbers. Is it possible that that statement about the relationship between numbers is one of the currently unproven conjectures like Goldbach? And that, that could be it. That's kind of why I wanted to talk about the Fermat's last theorem, because you could tur- turn that, from that statement, you know, x to the n plus y to the n, into a girdle number, and then yeah. talk about the arithmetic of that girdle number. And you, they, mathematicians have been able to prove statements of numbers by then proving statements about the numbers they represent. That does happen, yes. That, that kind of metamathematical stuff happens. Um, as far as I know, the Goldbach conjecture from Oslo's theorem, they're still open within that system. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know exactly. I'm not I'm kind of up to date on the, the literature on that, but I know, you know, logicians definitely study that and that process. So the, I, I would say the argument that Lucas and Penrose made is that we're, we're designing these machines, let's say one computer, and it has a finite set of axioms, rules of inference, circuitry, that kind of stuff. So because it's all finite, then Girdle showed that there's an issue. Uh, there's always going to be a statement that that computer cannot prove or know. I guess we're trying to argue that, well, that same limitation exists to humans just on a bigger level right now. Like we, we could do more than computers in, in many ways. So we still have that kind of same, I still think, you know, the argument is we still have that same issue because our output is, is finite. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm sure we have uh, a lot of good questions, but right now it's uh, uh, 101 uh, p.m. So uh, um, uh, <laughs> I, I, this is a very captivating talk, uh, I'm pretty sure. Let's thank our speaker one more time.
if you're my man.